Hello and welcome to Japanese Politics 101 with Timothy Langley, CEO of Langley Esquire and me, Maya Matsuoka, your host. Today is August the 15th and we're going to talk about Mr. Suga's standing, COVID, the vaccines, uh, the climate change and geopolitics. Timothy Langley is with us. So, Timothy, thank you very much for preparing for today again. The floor is yours. We've got a lot of things that we're going to talk about, so I'll try and reduce the amount of time I devote to any one of them so that, once again, we can have uh, the real beef of the um, discussion after the, the, the briefing on the various issues. So I've got like six different issues to talk about, and uh, the object here is to uh, generate a discussion among uh, the audience and people in the audience to weigh in on issues that they know a little bit more about or maybe they have some insight in, or perhaps if they have questions about things that they don't quite understand, that we can open a dialogue there. So it's not all about me talking and um, pretending like I know everything, because that's obviously not true, um, but uh, to generate a, a, a free flow of, of exchange of information. There's a lot going on, and um, let me get right to it. Uh, I get asked all the time now, now that the Olympics are over, uh, so what's going on with Mr. Suga? It's, it's something that comes up um, all the time. So let me address that one now because I'm, I'm sure that that's what people are, are curious about. They're curious about other things too, but Mr. Suga's standing is not really um, held in high regard among uh, the members of the parliament who are LDP members. Um, so there's actually a battle going on within the LDP. <clears throat> it's starting to come out a little bit now, as, as I predicted it would. It'll start getting a little bit more heated. Um, the main forces are Nikai on one side, and then you've got Mr. Abe, who is aligned with Mr. Aso, who is the Deputy Prime Minister and Foreign Minister. Um, and you've got uh, the Kishida faction, who is uh, popular among a certain a cadre of LDP members, and um, this this fight, this kind of three-way fight, um, is going to determine how um, the prime minister is uh, elected or appointed, or maybe just transitioned. We talked about this uh, a, a little bit last week about you know the various scenarios that maybe the prime minister stays or uh, he he's challenged. He's challenged with a kind of a, a floating candidate who is not really a serious contender, but just somebody that's a placeholder so that it looks like democracy is in action. They did this um, uh, the last time uh, to make sure that Mr. Ishiba was not um, viewed as the second contender. So they put in another candidate to make it look like Mr. Suga was appointed because there was a fair evaluation. We We know, in fact, that it wasn't. But a lot of this is, you know, it's it's um, it's at atmospherics. Uh, it's atmospherics for um, uh, the general population and for people who ascribe to the LDP. So that's part of the the deal that's going on. You will recall that there is a um, a committee that was set up within the Diet to determine when will be the election for the prime minister. And um, they came up with their first recommendation, and they said we make our second second recommendation on August 26th. <clears throat> so that's in in what um, 11 days? Yeah, 26. That's in 11 days that they will announce that. <clears throat> they will announce the election for LDP Prime Minister will be on this date, and um, Mr. Suga welds power in how they decide that, but he's not alone. And all of the competitors that I talked about also have a voice in that. Um, the person who is the head of that um, committee is not one of the top contenders. Uh, so I think that was probably why he was selected. And maybe there's some horse trading that they are in line to benefit from should the decision be the decision that the prime minister Wants because obviously all um, indicators show that Mr. Suga wants to remain in power. Um, so that decision will come out on the 26th. 
the um, interesting thing, um, the people who are throwing their hats in have not quite thrown their hats in. In order to throw your hat in, you need to have 20 people that endorse your candidacy. So for somebody like, you know, a, a political faction head who wants to run, for example, um, Mr. Kishida, who has more than 20 um, members in his faction, that's okay. For Konotaro, it's not his faction. It's Mr. Aso's faction. But I imagine if he's going to run, it's because Mr. Uh, Aso said, it's okay, son, you can run. And he's going to have his 20. But there are other contenders who have shown up over the last week, uh, surprisingly so, um, two women, actually, two women members of the parliament have, um, yeah, not quite um, tossed their hat in, but have kind of raised their hand and said that they would like to um, uh, be a candidate for prime minister. <clears throat> so uh, the contenders are starting to to show up. And maybe we, we should talk a little bit about who those people are and what their likelihood or what their chances of success are and from where they come. So with that, I, I'd just like to spend a little bit of time on that and then talk about Mr. Suga's uh, political standing so that it gives you a bit of a flavor of, you know, if he's going to remain in power, <clears throat> and there is a, a likelihood that he remains in power. If he remains in power, that means that there's a lot of horse trading that needs to go on in the back room. Um, so let's talk about the contenders. Frequently, whenever it comes to this point in, in time in Japanese politics, the uh, frequent refrain is, well, uh, we'd like to keep um, uh, the current prime minister because there's really nobody that really has the kahunas who can, who can lead the country, who can be the prime minister. We hear that all the time. And it's, it, it's not necessarily true. The problem is, in, in Japanese politics, the ones who are really competent and capable are typically already in the cabinet. And once you're in the cabinet, you cannot um, voice a, a dissent against the person who is leading the cabinet because he holds the position. He gets to decide whether he wants to remain or not. And as a cabinet minister who is appointed by him, through hook or crook maybe, maybe not personally, but um, it is undiplomatic of you to challenge the boss. So if you're going to do that, you need to resign from your really juicy um, ministerial portfolio, become um, independent of the cabinet, maybe not independent of your political party, but independent of the cabinet and run um, with uh, the endorsement of 20 people. So that fist fight will start um, pretty soon, um, in a couple of weeks, not right away, but pretty soon. So, um, maybe we should start from the top and, and talk about who are the, the most, um, likely political contenders. And right now it comes to, um, Konotaro has said, um, I would like to run. And by the way, when they issued this report on the 26th, it happens to be uh, the day before I issue my manifesto. So he's he's already having, um, he's working on his political manifesto. If I become prime minister, this is what I'm going to do. He's already the minister of um, administrative reform. He's, he's very popular. He's on the TV all the time. He's talking about COVID and um, a lot of people know him and are, are favorably inclined to him, but not, not everybody and um, many within the LDP rank and file are not, predisposed to him. He hasn't had any LDP party post. So he, he hasn't, you know, done a lot of favors for people to help them get elected or to increase their, their power base. So he lacks a little bit of that, but uh, his, his big daddy, Taro Aso, is the minister of finance, which is um, arguably the most uh, powerful ministry. And he's been um, a minister of finance after he was Prime Minister, then Deputy Prime Minister. He's been Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance for a long time throughout the entire Abe administration. So he welds considerable weight. And whether um, Tato Aso holds um, a lot of debt from other members of the parliament, at least the old man does, Tato Aso does. And I would imagine if um, he receives the, 
the nod to go ahead and, and run, which I think he already has, um, he can call in those debts. So he's a, he's a serious contender. Um, Shimura Hakubun, who is um, in the LDP uh, uh, party apparatus, um, not in the cabinet. He was in the cabinet. He was minister of, of education. Very close friends with uh, Mr. Abe because he's in the Abe faction. Um, he has um, uh, indicated that he's willing to go and uh, he would be a probably a top contender within the Abe faction. Um, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, he doesn't have all the charisma and all of the the um, the attributes that a, a successful prime ministerial candidate would have, but um, he has the backing of, uh, presumably the backing of the Abe faction, which is the uh, Hosoda faction, actually. Um, so he would be a serious contender. Uh, then we have uh, Motegi Toshimitsu, who is the foreign minister. So the foreign minister portfolio is always a great leapfrog into prime ministership. Um, it's frequently been used, very successfully used. So, and he's done a great job. He's um, he's very smart. He speaks English. He's um, he's got uh, several portfolios um, as as uh, minister of state, and um, he is a very likely contender. There are two others who um, are contenders that are people are talking about, but they haven't uh, revealed their intentions yet. The first one is uh, Kishida Fumio, who is the um, top person in the Kishida faction, who ran for um, prime minister before. Um, he has a large following among the younger members of the LDP and certain seg uh, segments of the established. Um, and he's kind of a, a spoiler. He's, he's got a little bit of an issue in his uh, faction because... <clears throat> His number two is a fellow by the name of uh, Hayashi. Hayashi, uh, what's Hayashi's first name? Um, but uh, Hayashi is uh, um, a very, very popular uh, politician uh, in the same election district as um, Mr. Abe. And um, probably more popular than Mr. Kishida. The problem with Mr. Hayashi is that he's in the upper house and the prime minister has never come from the upper house. He's only come from the lower house election, but that's not a rule. That's just what has happened. Nevertheless, Mr. Hayashi has run for prime minister in the past. He lost, obviously, but he's always retained his upper house position for like six times. So that's six times six, because it's a six year term. That means he's been in the diet, the upper house for 36 years. He's going to give up that cushy position, that guaranteed position, guaranteed for six years. He's going to resign from the upper house and he's going to run in the lower house. Um, it's kind of, it's, it's like when we talk about, uh, um, you know, the, the, the governor of Tokyo coming in and, and running in the lower house and, you know, giving up her position as uh, governor of Tokyo. There's just not enough time for her to do that, to accumulate the goodwill and the uh, renown that is required to become prime minister in a uh, parliamentary uh, process for her to become prime minister. So he, he also faces that, that problem. But um, going into the lower house at this election, Maybe we are back in the realm of there's going to be a new prime minister every uh, 13 or 16 months. Uh, that's that's a possibility, and he's just going to bide his time. But anyway, Kishida has not thrown his, his hat in, and maybe that's why. I'm not sure. Um, the second person who hasn't thrown their hat in that is curious and people are waiting is uh, Shigeru Ishiba. Um, he hasn't uh, committed. Um, when he, uh, when when Mr. Abe said he's sick and he's not going to run, and Mr. Suga was uh, appointed as the successor to his remaining term of office, which was one year, which is why we're having this election in um, in a month or so, uh, Shigeru Ishiba also uh, said, "I would like to be prime minister as well." It was quietly um, maintained in LDP offices. 
um, they floated Mr. Uh, Kishida as the contender only because they didn't want Mr. Ishiba to be qualified as the second, the number two candidate who lost to Mr. Suga. So they, they fixed things up. Mr. Um, uh, Ishiba actually got a lot of votes from within the LDP. They changed their votes at the last minute. You know, this this election of Mr. Suga was a 24-hour deal. Um, it happened very quickly, and it was all orchestrated by um, Mr. Nikai, <clears throat> whose name comes up again and again. In this list of, of potential candidates for prime minister, there are a couple of people who are missing. One of them is Mr. Nikai. Uh, N- Mr. Nikai is 78 years old. <clears throat> um, he is one of the most powerful um, members of the LDP. It's his job as secretary general to pick the election districts, among other things, to, to pick the election districts of uh, during an election. So you can imagine his, his uh, preeminence at this particular point in time is, is very high. So he, he wields a lot of weight. And so there are election districts, um, when the upper ho- when the lower house comes for election, um, there are people who, um, hold a, a house seat there. Um, they come up for election, so they have to go for their seat again. Mr. Nikai doesn't have a lot of weight in putting somebody else in that position if they're succeeding themselves. He doesn't have a lot of weight for a LDP person who has run in that district and maybe he came in second place and the um, incumbent is not going to run again. So he would probably get that. He does have lots of, of, of power to determine in an election district where it's kind of up for grabs, who is going to run in that district. And there are a couple of districts that come up um, that are challenged by Mr. Abe, Mr. Aso, uh, Mr. Kishida, and Mr. Uh, Nikai's faction. And Mr. Nikai is in the catbird situation where he gets to choose. And I don't want Abe's candidate in. I don't want your candidate. I want my candidate in. So you can see there's a lot of self-dealing that's that's possible there and it is infuriating um, the other parties. There's already a couple of fights going on there. In any event, Mr. Nikai is not running. Mr. Abe is also unlikely to run. I know people ask that all the time, but with the revelation that the public prosecutor's office opened, reopened the investigation that was closed about his Sakura o Mirukai, the uh, flower viewing uh, event that was held uh, every year. It was a, a, a fundraising um, event. Uh, the, the fundraising that was gone on there Mr. Abe, while he was prime minister, was able to uh, smooth that over. The public prosecutor's office had an investigation and they determined uh, nothing to see here. Let's move on. Uh, Mr. Abe um, resigned. The public prosecutor changed hands. The new public prosecutor is uh, famously against Mr. Abe, a long, long term um, enemy of, of Mr. Abe. And he's reopened that investigation and definitely they'll find something there. So it's unlikely that Mr. Abe would um, would run. Uh, he would have to do it as a surrogate uh, through somebody else. Um, so that's that's the basically the, the political uh, layout. There are two new people who have come in, two females. Noda Seiko, who you will remember has um, uh, c- come up in, in the past. She wanted to challenge the uh, prime minister's position. Um, um, against uh, Mr. Um, uh, Abe when when that um, came up. She was unable to get the 20 um, signatories. She almost got it. She's not she's not a member of a faction, uh, but she's a, a, a sweetheart of Mr. Nikai. Um, but she wasn't able to get that. So she's um, raised her voice and said she would like to do it. And also Bunshin just reported that um, Sanai Takeichi, um, who has um, been, you know, a, what would you say, like a, a butterfly around the light. She's in and out. Uh, she, she has had a ministerial portfolio. She also doesn't have, uh, she doesn't belong to a faction, although she's very close to Mr. Abe. <clears throat> she has also reported in Bunshin that she would like to 
to do that. So right now we have like five or six um, potential candidates. They won't come up for another maybe three weeks or four weeks. Once this um, um, committee report comes out on the 26th, then all, all the gloves will be off. Uh, first out of the shoot is Mr. Konotaro with his manifesto, and you'll see a lot of other manifestos coming out. You might remember that a couple of years ago, it was the battle of the manifestos. Somebody came up with the idea, let's do a manifesto and tell people actually what our administration would look at look like. Isn't that a great idea? So it was um, a, a, a well short-lived um, um, scenario. Uh, it wasn't repeated because Mr. Abe uh, just uh, replaced himself over and over again. But I, I think that you might see the manifesto coming out again. I think it's actually a good idea for people to be elected on in the terms of their, their policy. Um, whether they follow that policy um, is another thing, but at least they put it down on paper, and it's not just a personality contest as it almost always has been. Um, so uh, there, there's a lot more to talk about. There's a lot to talk about with um, Mr. Abe versus Mr. Nikai and Mr. Taro Aso versus Nikai. I think I'd, I'd push that off to next week because there's a lot of other things that are going on. But um, it's important to point out that uh, Yokohama has their election next Sunday. Uh, you remember we talked about Yokohama having the election for mayor um, last week. And the reason why it's important is because it is in Kanagawa. Yokohama belongs to Kanagawa. And in Kanagawa, there are like six ministers who have election districts in Kanagawa, including the current prime minister and uh, Konotaro uh, Motegi. There, there are a bunch of people in Kanagawa and the mayor of, of uh, Yokohama is going to have the, um, not, not the blanket um, approval, but uh, is going to be able to weigh in heavily on the IR um, plan to make uh, the casino in Yokohama. They already have the land identified for that. And the debate now is, will Yokohama support uh, the building of the IR, maybe the first IR um, in Japan, um, or will they pass it up and let uh, Tokyo and uh, Osaka or somebody else deal with it? Under the current law, there are three sites that will be uh, three, um, what would you call it? like three bids, three um, areas that can host um, an IR project. And they will see how that goes. And then they might open it up later. So the first the first ones out of the shoot are, are critically important. And um, they're in the, the most largely populated areas so that the uh, facilities for uh, transportation and bringing people in from overseas, uh, inter entertainers and whales and, and that sort of thing, so the most likely um, areas are Fukuoka, Osaka, Tokyo, and Yokohama, although there are a couple of other contenders too. So this fight about the IRs is occurring now in Yokohama. It's not a direct fight. Um, IRs, yes or no. But the candidates, and they, they have eight candidates. So last week when we were on this um, program, we were talking about it, and I said that um, the number of candidates might be there so that it just, uh, with so many candidates, it splits the vote and it allows for the possibility of a dark horse coming up. Somebody that you didn't think would be elected is suddenly elected because of the other candidates. They look similar, they split the vote, and then the dark horse comes up. That's also a possibility with the um, prime ministerial election with Mr. Suga. Um, a bit of a diversion there, but it, it's a tactic that, that you know works sometimes. In Yokohama, you've got uh, eight candidates. Um, the former mayor, she's been there um, uh, four times, four uh, terms consecutively. Um, the LDP has asked her not to run because she's getting a little bit long in the tooth and it's time for somebody else. And she's given them the one finger salute and said, I think I'm going to run again. That makes the LDP angry. They have put their own candidate there who was a minister of state who resigned from that wonderful position to be a candidate for Yokohama. <clears throat> Unfortunately, he said, I don't like the casino. And he's, you know, a protege of Mr. Suga. So what happens next Sunday is 
one once again another bellwether of how Mr. Suga is doing um, is the current incumbent, the four-term uh, female mayor, going to win? And she's been somewhat ambivalent about uh, hosting the IR, or is the LDP candidate um, who doesn't support the LDP stance on uh, the uh, the uh, integrated resorts? Does he come in, or the former governor of Nagano? I mean, there there are eight of uh, you know, six other candidates there. It's it's something to really watch and draw uh, conclusions from that. When we meet next week, um, the election uh, the election will start on Sunday, um, and it just depends on on how that goes. I won't be able to uh, announce the results of that on Sunday, but we can um, revisit that because between now and next Sunday, a lot of other things are going to happen about uh, COVID about Mr. Suga, about Mr. Abe, a, a bunch of things are on the schedule to be happening and I'll report on that and we can make a couple of predictions. Um, I think I've really gone on overboard on Mr. Suga, so I'd like to close that up and move on to my other. Are there any questions? Um, I Actually, it's not a question, but um, you know, we mentioned that probably Konotaro is uh, the most likely um, contender uh, uh, for prime minister, right? And I just right. wonder, and also you mentioned that uh, Mr. Suga, there is a possibility for him uh, remaining in power, remaining in, well, being re-elected. Uh, but both of them have had really a kind of, um, I mean, they, their reputation has been blemished, right? And not so much Konotaro, but because of uh, the COVID vaccination rollout. So right. it has been quite difficult, you know, for the for the party to remain, uh, you know, very supportive of him. Of course, the party is not so supportive of Mr. Suga. So I wonder how, you know, uh, it will play out just at the end of the this is This is a great question. So in a, in a situation like Mr. Suga, he's diminished. So the likelihood of him succeeding himself is somewhat smaller and it's a perfect opportunity to horse trade. Right. What I mean by that is um, maybe Mr. Abe, Mr. Aso. You know, Mr. Nikai likes Mr. Suga. Mr. Nikai uh, is responsible for Mr. Suga being in the position that he's in. Mr. Nikai is hated by um, the others because he's standing in their way. Um, so you could... Envision, and I'm sure it's, it happens over drinks and, and coffee and, and that sort of thing, maybe while Mr. Suga is doing his sit-ups, um, that uh, he's having a conversation with other people that says, look, we know that you're indebted to Mr. Nikai, but your, your numbers just don't look very good. And if we fight against you, uh, we can have uh, a, a real potential of knocking you off. And if we knock you off, you're still going to be a member of the diet, but nobody's going to talk to you anymore. We'll blame everything on you. On the other hand, if you, um, you know, you put this dagger, dagger in the back of Mr. Nikai, uh, we'll let you still be prime minister. I think that's a, a likely conversation. It doesn't mean that he's going to continue to be prime minister or after the election of the lower house, because uh, the, the LDP is not going to do very well. And the fact that Mr. Suga continues to be prime minister might diminish that even more. And so that means like maybe three months after he's put the knife in the, the back and he continues to be prime minister, he's kicked out and there's another election. That's um, in, uh, under any scenario. That's a likely scenario. Right. Because obviously, um, I mean, LDP members realize that Mr. Suga is not uh, the best candidate for the next uh, ministerial prime minister's uh, post. But at the same time, yeah, he's supported by Mr. Nikai. And also, I mean, LDP realizes that they need a new face. That's right. And probably Mr. Connell, he's got uh, the popular uh, support. Pop uh, I mean, the population's really li population likes him, but at the same time, the, the rollout of uh, the vaccination problem has had a lot of problems too. So it's uh, really interesting how things will play out at the end. It's, yeah. it's really interesting. And um, the, you, you mentioned the rollout of the vaccine. So I'm going to talk about 
uh, the vaccines yeah. uh, in my next uh, portion. But um, Mr. Suga wants this commission that's going to report their findings on the 26th of this month to push back his election date as far as possible so that he can brag more about, you know, we've, we've reached 40 percent of of inoculations. So uh, that's what he can say today. Right. He wants to be able to say 55 percent or 60 percent. Um, any number that's better than what the number is now. I mean, he, he he has so few things to look at and point to to say, I did that. That's because I'm your prime minister. Let's do more of this. Right. He has so few of those. So you'll be hearing him tout his horn and pushing off the uh, the date of the uh, prime ministerial election as as far as possible. It is also possible that they give him an extension that they extend his term of office, he, it, he must end on, um, there must be a new prime minister on September 30th. So the, uh, the money is mostly on him um, resigning on the 29th, them having the election, and then the new prime minister, and then the new prime minister closing the house and having the election, or maybe doing it around the same time. There is the possibility of this commission extending his term of office so that we have the house of election house of uh, lower house elections first and then his election i think that's what he would like um i don't think that that's i can't say if that's in the cards or not i see well thank you for that it just strikes me that uh, japan does need a uh, well a strong prime minister and even i mean not only from inside but also from outside things don't look like uh, there is a strong prime minister at the moment. And yes, if Mr. Suga continues to be uh, PM here, probably there will be a lot of, uh, let's say, um, considerations out of the country as well. So with the neighbors, within the neighbors and so on. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it looks like, okay, we've got two people. Let's see. Okay. Uh, Hayato, I'm letting you on stage now. And also Jennifer, here you are, right? Thank good morning, you. Hayato. Oh. oh, hi, good morning. I'd like to add to the team of this comment, uh, two things. One is, uh, you know, the Mr. Abe is still planning to run uh, as far as I know, because I checked with uh, his circles a couple of times, but, but he only wants to run if he can win at the landslide victory, like which he did for like the last three or four, you know, elections or his terms, right? So, so for that, like he's just uh, watching. So for the, for the, the or, or this, their inner circle camp, you know, the prosecutor's thing was like a nothing uh, in, in their view, right? So that's, uh, I'm, I'd like to share with you. And also another one is uh, from the camp, Abe camp, you know, Takaichi is a candidate for now, Sanae Takaichi. So she's the one that's going to get the, the vote and support of, of a hostile section going forward, uh, if, it, if it is as is. But we're just watching to see how the whole party is going to turn out. Right, so I'm done talking. Yeah, I think she would have a hard time um, going against um, Hakubun, Shimomura, if, um, the, um, if it came to that. The, the political faction is not going to endorse two candidates. And uh, he, they owe him, Hakabun. He's he's probably number three in the um, in the faction. Oh, oh well, one more thing, you know the Konotaro. You know I don't know what's wrong with it, but you know the you, you know the Aso was not really moving as if you heard the same thing. Yes, to that's right. Collect his uh, twenty recommendation, right? So if he's not going to, uh, it's uh, Aso's, Aso's going to collect it. He's not going to run. So you know I, I don't know what's wrong with it. I'll let you know if I know. Okay. It's it's not time to collect those 20 signatures yet, um, but it is curious. Um, maybe, you know, they're in the same faction. You know, Mr. Aso owns Konotara. I think that's probably a rude thing to say, but, you know, it, it is Mr. Aso's faction. Um, he welds uh, far more power than Konotaro. Konotaro would very unlikely... Uh, run on his own, you know, like leave leave the Aso faction to run on his own. He is uh, strong-headed. Um, he could pull something like that off, but I don't think it would be successful. So I, I, I don't see that. I, you know, if Taro Aso is 
publishing his manifesto, I think that indicates that he's got the green light. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, so I guess, uh, you know, Mr. Asso, my view is maybe watching to see how he's going to play his politics, you know. So watching to see who is uh, stronger and then maybe put the, his uh, bit at the last minute, <laughs> which he can afford to, right? Um, yes. Talk- I, yeah, I, I agree with you. And I think um, Abe is going to play the same game. The problem with, with um, the Abe candidacy is that if there are a lot of contenders, um, it's, it's, it becomes a little bit nastier. If it's just, you know, if he's able to swing it so that, I don't know, he, he continues to let Nikai be secretary general and he gives um, Mr. Um, Suga some, you know, Benny so that he steps aside. Um, you, you can imagine that, but I think there's just too much pressure and too much attention on. I don't know if he could he could finesse it like that. Jennifer, good morning. Hi, Maya. Hi, mm-hmm. Timothy. Hi, hi, Ato. Um, Timothy, thank you so much for giving such a great overview of all the candidates. This is all new to me, so I'm wow. I'm learning thank- a lot. <laughs> um, so it was really interesting to me that you mentioned that Konotaro is coming out with a manifesto. Um, it is interesting, yeah. I- yeah, and did you say that this was the – is he the only candidate that's that's coming out with such a thing? Is is this the first time that's ever been done? Because that seems like the transparency and the clarity would be so appealing to the Japanese people and would really gain him some points. Oh, it's it's a great idea. It has been done in the past. Every, every candidate produced their own manifesto. There was a big um, um, push for people who could write policy reports. Uh, to come up with these manifestos that were actually readable and concise and actually reflected the uh, positions of the individuals or the the political factions or even the parties. So the parties actually had their own manifesto too. Um, so it's been done in the past. He, uh, the, the unique thing about this particular instance is that he's come out way before anybody else and announced, um, he announced it um just at the time that they were announcing this committee that was going to decide when the presidential election, uh, the prime minister election will be, I'm sorry, the pri- presidential election would be. So it's an election for, for president of the LDP, which by default in this um, parliamentary democracy becomes the prime minister. Thank you. That's fascinating. And I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, reading his manifesto. It'll be the first one of any candidate that I've read. So I'll be interested to see how detailed it is. Well, we'll, we'll, def- we'll definitely talk about it here on this show. And by that time, by the 27th, there is going to be so much to talk about. You guys are going to be so sick of me. And we're going to probably have to have this, this room you know, extended by about an hour and a half or two hours uh, just to get all of the, the uh political news in and not even talk about anything else. I think that sounds awesome. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. So if you've been following the news, um, about 40% of the Japanese population has now been inoculated at least once. And the great thing about that is that among the, um, the old farts, the old people, that's about um, 60%. Um, maybe even 80% have at least received one. So the, um, uh, the, um, the administration has been very successful in inoculating what we thought was the most at-risk area of the population. We thought this six months ago, it's the people that are 60 years and older. So that's where the focus was. 80% of them all having at least um, one inoculation. It's, it's pretty good news. Um, overall, the entire Japanese population is about 40%. Um, the problem with that is that we've had some uh, breakthrough um, viruses that have come in, and that has um, reflected poorly on the administration for a bunch of reasons. Not only the fact that uh, they only really started to come in Gosh, you hate to say this as a consequence of the Olympics, kind of, um, but also that it wasn't really disclosed. So um, Mr. Suga promised the Japanese uh, public that he would hold a safe 
and uh, effective um, Olympics. There were bubbles that were created um, that the coaches, that the referees, that the teams uh, traveled in. Um, that was uh, pretty well done, but not perfect. And the, um, the Delta variant entered Japan this maybe the day before the Olympics started, and it was brought in by a um, um, somebody who was affiliated with the Olympics um, administration. It wasn't an athlete or a coach, but it did come in and um, it was not reported. So that's created a little bit of controversy um, against the uh, Suga administration. The vaccines by location, Japan is standing uh, pretty good um, overall, uh, worldwide. Uh, 15% of the population globally has been vaccinated. Uh, so when you think of that and you think, you know, it's the advanced countries, the ones that have better access to Moderna and the Pfizer uh, vaccines, they're the ones that are going to have uh, better access to the vaccines. Uh, that proves out to be true. In terms of where Japan stands compared to everybody else, about 35.8%, I said earlier 40%, I think it's about 40%, uh, it, it increases every day, of uh, the Japanese population has been um, vaccinated. Uh, India is 8.5%, the United States is about 50%, Brazil 22%, Germany 55%, United Kingdom 59%. Um, there are some countries that um, are really suffering, um, for example, India is only 8.5% and the Delta variant there is really doing a lot of damage. Um, the, um, the response of the Japanese government in light of the Delta variant is um, encroaching upon us very um, imminently because the, um, uh, the Paralympics are starting um, in just a few days. Um, they'll start on the, the 23rd. Um, and, uh, I'm sorry, the 24th, it, it'll run from the 24th until September 5th. So it hasn't started yet. Um, but even with the Olympics, there were 400 in, uh, infections there. Uh, so some teams were, um, uh, prevented from training. Some teams actually were, um, escorted back out of the country, weren't, weren't able to, uh, participate. And some teams just, uh, decided they're not going to participate. At the last minute, they decided they were not going to participate for a bunch of reasons. One was, we don't feel safe. Maybe that was the public pronouncement, or maybe they had five or six guys who had qualified, had um, uh, tested positive, and they, rather than saying that, they said, you know, we, we just don't feel safe. Um, the Paralympics will start, and the question now is, in light of this Delta variant, and it is, it is exploding, um, uh, I think uh, 85% of the new infections in Tokyo are caused by the Delta variant and probably about uh, 40% in Osaka are, are because of the Delta variant. So it, it is a very serious um, uh, increase. The, the, the great thing about it, there are two great things about it. Number one is it is not as deadly. It's just more transmissible. And the second thing is that if people um, complain early enough, there is a, um, a, a shot that they can receive um, that's been co-developed uh, by Japan. So there is access, there is manufacturing here, that if they get it into the system of the person within five days of the first signs of having COVID, it diminishes to a very high degree the severity of the, um, the, the virus, whether it's COVID, uh, the Delta variant or the regular variant. Um, it has uh, passed trials and it is being uh, distributed now. So that's a kind of good thing. But um, what's going on with, um, uh, you know, inoculations and um, the, the Japanese government response, it's, it's a day-to-day -day thing. And Mr. Uh, Suga is pushing it very hard. You see on, on the television. The problem is, is that uh, I guess even like with uh, Governor Koike, when you see her, and she was doing daily press conferences, that the toll began to, to take. And Mr. Suga's uh, position <clears throat> is far more complex than running the city of Tokyo, although that's a, a major hurdle. 
but even with her, she, she had a, a bit of a breakdown and, uh, you know, uh, pulled herself out of the public limelight at a time when she was really necessary to be there. And that was during the elections of the Tokyo municipal, um, body. Um, and, and you look at Mr. Suga now and he like, um, who maybe Jennifer was saying, or maybe it was uh, Maya, that, you know, you look at him on TV and how, how he performs, how he delivers his speeches and his posture. Um, you know, the, the, the people who are going to be going to election want somebody that's more powerful and much more dynamic and, and has vigor. And um, the more and more time that this goes on, I mean, it's, you know, my heart goes out to him because it is just a tough situation. Um, and it all reflects on, you know, his ability to succeed himself and the ability to succeed himself. As we talk about on this show is not just about his performance or his demeanor or um, that sort of thing. The politics is going to de determine that. And that's why, why this show is so important. That's why this room is, is so um you know, it, I hope it's interesting, but that, that's why it's so vital for us to get a handle on that, because the politics really dictates a lot. And what happens in Japanese society, what happens with COVID, what happens with the Olympics, what happens with the digital agency is all kind of determined by politics, but also guides politics. What happens? So we're going to talk about all of those things because they all make sense and they all um, they all develop a result that uh, we're all affected by. So. Um, with the, um, the COVID, um, inoculations, I think, um, probably by, uh, December or January, um, we will have, uh, achieved something like herd, uh, immunity and the, um, restrictions on travel will, uh, start to, uh, be diminished. They'll start to be diminished probably September, October, um, the, uh, passport, the, um, vaccine passport has is already being issued now. You can go on and apply for one and probably get it within days um, and use that for travel. Um, more and more countries are reciprocating by accepting um, uh, the Japanese uh, COVID passport as well as the uh, passports from various countries as well. So that's all I want to say about COVID because I got three other, uh, four other issues I want to hit on. But with that, I'd like to wrap that up. Everybody that's in this room, that's been in this room for one or two times knows that uh, the dig digital agency was one of the um, hallmarks or is one of the hallmarks of the uh, Suga administration. He became uh, prime minister and uh, within three months launched the digital agency. This has never been done. A, a, a new agency, a new ministry created in such um, with such speed. And um, it is a remarkable feat, and he should be uh, roundly congratulated for that. The digital agency um, is already pre-established. They have an office. They have staff. Um, not so much of a budget. They've got a preliminary budget. And they will be launched on September 1st. There was a little bit of concern that they wouldn't be launched on time because of the delays that were experienced um, earlier in the year, uh, but it now looks like they're gung-ho gung on it, and they're going to launch the digital agency on September 1st. <clears throat> Their headquarters will be three or four floors um, over by the New Otani. There is a, um, um, a business complex there where the new Prince Hotel is, um, the Akasaka Prince Hotel, um, and it's in the same floor as Yahoo!, uh, the same uh, building as Yahoo. So they've secured the, the space there. They'll start moving in. Uh, the budget allocation will kick in. And uh, they made an, a an really amazing announcement this week. I don't know if you caught it, but Joey Ito has been tapped to lead the digital agency. Not as the minister, because we already know who the minister is, but this will be like the director general, um, you know, running the operation, Joey Ito. And Joey Ito is, is such an excellent choice because, you know, he got his, his start uh, here in Japan. Um, in fact, I, I worked in the same building with him when he was first getting started in, um, in not Akasaka Mitsuke, but uh, Akasaka proper. 
old Akasaka. Um, we, we were in the same building there. He was um, uh, launching what eventually became uh, the digital garage um, and went on to um, uh, San Francisco and um, uh, the Miti um, Media Labs. He, he um, ran that. And I think he's just an excellent choice to, to lead this. He's going to bring a lot of Silicon Valley expertise, um, you know, funding, venture capital, uh, great ideas um, on, on how to move the country forward. I think it's an excellent idea. Um, the, the story that came out was his affiliation with um, Epstein. What's his first name? Jeffrey Epstein, the guy that didn't kill himself, you remember? <clears throat> so... Um, it's supposed to be something of a scandal, but it's not a scandal. Um, it wasn't that um, Joey Ito was flying on the airplane uh, to go to visit the, the private island or the, the mansion because probably Joey Ito wasn't big enough. He wasn't a prince or a king or secretary of state or something like that. He was just small potatoes. So I don't think he, he participated in that, but he did receive the, the uh, Miti Labs, Media Labs, did accept uh, some funding from uh, Jeffrey Epstein, and that caused a big brouhaha when it when it came out. And he was implicated, but he resigned. He he resigned from his position and took contrition. And um, I think that's that's the end of it. The reason why it became a, a a big issue is just because of Jeffrey Epstein. But I don't think it it splays a lot of of dirt and muck on Joey Ito. But um, that is the, the big thing that's happening now in the digital agency that they have uh, appointed him. He'll be moving back to, to Tokyo and to take the reins there. I would imagine uh, the, the salary to get him there is uh, enormous uh, because he can make a lot of money all on his own and has. So it's, it's, a, good, it's a good signal for us. Um, less encouraging is the uh, push for um, diminishing fax machines. You remember that uh, Konotaro coming um, on strong said, you know, I'm going to suggest how Japan can uh, further modernize and accommodate, um, you know, the digital um, uh, culture. And one of the things that prevents the Japanese from doing that is the reliance on faxes and the hanko, this this system of having the, the um, hanko represent your signature and in companies, you have what's called a jitsuin, which is a hanko for companies, but it's called a different name, but it's essentially a hanko for a company, uh, to represent the decision of the corporation to buy a car or to, re, you know, um, engage in a contract or uh, to get a bank loan, that sort of thing. Um, he made great headway. He ordered all of the uh, ministries to uh, cease having faxes. It caused a bit of a, a pushback, uh, only, only uh, a light pushback, and then it began to, to develop into a crescendo. And he came back um, with um, a report to, look, if you, don't, if you cannot meet the um, goal of stopping all faxes within your ministry by September 1, please give me a cogent re reason why you can't do that. And he was flooded with about 400 cogent reasons. And that generated um, some exemptions from the rule and a lot of, um, you know, uh, scratching of heads of how we can continue to keep uh, these fax machines going. And probably a lot of political pressure from, you know, Panasonic and, and a lot of the companies who build these fax machines or they build the phone that has the fax machine. I mean, who even uses these anymore? But. Uh, the problem is, is that uh, there are a couple of uh, powerful ministries that rely on them a lot. And also the diet members rely on them a lot. So one of the problems that we're going to have with the digital agency is getting the members of the diet to come up the curve because of, of all of the people in Japanese society. It's, uh, I think, not a, a huge secret that the members of the parliament are one of the, the, the laggards. Um, also, the um, uh, the legal, um, what do you call it, the Ministry of Justice is also a bit of a laggard there. Um, and uh, a couple of the ministries rely on receiving faxes and also um, reports 
and and the the great thing about the the facts is that you can convey your message by using your own handwritten calligraphy, right? And some people feel like that is part of the messaging that they want to convey as well. Um, but the big push is to uh, eliminate the faxes. Um, that is a push that will probably continue to generate a little bit of backlash and noise. But, you know, you go for the, the low-hanging fruit, and you would think that faxes would be easy. Maybe um, the hankos a little bit less because hankos do have a great utility, and it, it is a part of the, the business culture and just the way of doing things here that has some some great benefits. Um, but eventually that, that will fall by the wayside as well. So um, looking forward to uh, the launch of the, uh, the digital agency. It, it will happen in another uh, three weeks. And I think it will be with a lot of fanfare. You cannot expect to see uh, great results um, right away. It'll be two years, maybe three years. You'll see a couple of things happening with the, the lower hanging fruit. Um, but then, as in a lot of things, even with the rollout of the, the vaccines, it takes Japan a while to get going. But once they've got things down and there's a lot of political um, uh, uh, desire behind the, the digital agency that, um, you know, give it three years or so and you, you'll start to see the, um, the benefits of that. It won't be right away, but it'll be, you know, in, in three years or in four years time, you look back and you say, you know, remember when it used to be like this, it's going to be vastly different. So that's my prediction. Um, anyway, with that, I'd like to move off of the digital agency and uh, move on to uh, my next topic. Next to last um, area of, of, of discussion, and I'm going to talk about uh, geopolitics after this session. So if Stephen, are you in the room? Stephen Nagy, we're going to talk about that. And so um, I'm looking forward to your input and analysis as well. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about climate now. So um, the rains have been going on for five days. They're going to go on for another five days. Um, they've just kind of been dumping water all over uh, Japan and um, areas in the south are are suffering because of the flooding and the landslides. The um, climate issue has um, reached something of, of code red. Uh, for those of you who don't know, there, there was a report that was published by the UN Government Panel on Climate Change on Monday. Uh, they had a, a press release. It went on for two hours. I attended that, and it is um, really stark. So the, the result of the, um, the report, it's not so much pointing a finger that the humans are at fault, but they do say that, um, you know, the production of CO2 – and man-made um, um, uh, contribution to global warming should be reduced. And this is going to have huge policy implications for Japan, for the United States, for a lot of countries. But, um, you know, Japan, hate to remind people, it's an island. And even Tokyo, um, you know, the, uh, the vast majority of, of Tokyo is at around uh, four meters above sea level. So even one meter above sea level, um, is going to produce, uh, you know, some disastrous changes to Yokohama and the port area. Uh, some countries in the, the uh, South Pacific will actually um, suffer even more. The prediction is that uh, by 2030, um, the temperature will rise by another 1.5 degrees. It's somewhat inevitable. Even if we stop everything now, that, that kind of gradual swinging of the, the um, pendulum, it just takes a while for it to slow down and stop. Even if we um, uh, implement all of the, uh, the, the uh, Kyoto Accord and the Paris Accord and the COP um, um, requirements to reduce uh, global war uh, greenhouse gases, it's still going to um, increase uh, the temperature. Some of that is just inevitable because of the 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 sun and the rotation of the earth and that sort of thing some of this is is cyclical but um even with that the um uh waters of the ocean are predicted to rise about one um one meter within the next uh, 20 years 
And if the uh, temperature increases another 1.5%, that means that the uh, waters of the ocean will rise about three meters. And that's, that prediction is in 2050, uh, unless something else is done. Um, and in, in addition to that, um, there are unanticipated things that happen when ice sheets begin to melt. Sometimes uh, they've done studies now that show that the um, predicted or anticipated melt water rushing off has somehow increased because of other things that have gone on as a consequence of that. For example, the um, uh, thawing of the permafrost and the release of methane gases. And also studies <clears throat> that have shown that the, the carbon sinks of, of Brazil or the oceans or uh, normal farming, the plowing of, of the fields and, and that sort of thing, um, the, the, the waters and the, the ocean, which is an absorber of carbon, is becoming a bit saturated. And so the ability to, to hold that. So there are a lot of things that are going on with regard to um, the climate. Um, when um, President Biden met with Suga um, about three months ago, um, the climate uh, contained a big part of their discussion. And both countries dedicated billions of dollars on restructuring and on um, um, doing things differently for environmental uh, effect or impact, uh, including um, uh, electric cars and um, condensers and, and that sort of thing. So uh, the key feature of of the the reason why I'm talking about this now is that is because you will see increasingly now because of this report from from the UN um, more policies that come out that um, are in, inflicting a greater responsibility on manufacturers and consumers um, to reduce uh, the carbon footprint. You'll see this beginning really uh, enormously. Uh, probably after um, the COP um, 20, well, it, there are different numbers for it, but the uh, COP discussions in uh, October and November um, in Geneva and Brussels. So um, a lot of that is, and also in Scotland. So this panel is, is going to meet again in, in Scotland. Um, a lot of that is going to happen towards the end of this year and policy implications will be reviewed and analyzed, and then uh, policies will, will be coming out of that. It's something you need to keep your eye on because it's very serious. It's code red as far as the UN is concerned. And so I think a lot of uh, agencies and politicians will be focusing on that. You don't hear much about it um, as this is my stance. This is where I stand on, on climate as a, as a campaign slogan. Um, I don't think you'll see much of that um, in the, the next election, but you could. So keep your eye on it. And that's what I wanted to flag to your attention. I'm through talking about climate for this point. Yato, what are your oh, thoughts on this? Hi, I'd like to add something there, right? Yes. So, you know, uh, in the climate change, this SDG, SDG compliant is going to become like a, so huge, you know, looks like, you know. So right. uh, mm -hmm. this meaning that, for example, you know, uh, last time when the Mitsubishi Bank has a shareholders meeting in June, there was uh, uh, the the motion by the shareholders that you know unless uh, you know they, they want shareholders want uh, the bank to uh, put in uh, you know the in the in, in the article of incorporation that you know they cannot do a business unless uh, you know they are hundred percent compliant. Uh, that meaning that you cannot do any banking or any any business with bank anymore if you're not hundred percent compliant. And that may come like as early as next June, right, 2022. Yeah, so then like everybody has to just like meet with a compliance requirement because, uh, you know, once you put in in a, in a bank comp you know, article incorporation, then, then the, you know, bank has to uh, be 100% compliant themselves and, and also the clients. The Mitsubishi Bank, uh, you know, they're raising, they're putting together like a two, $300 million uh, like a fund to, uh, for this climate change. And now the other banks are going to be following, but uh, everybody they have to do this kind of a uh, hundred percent like a zero coupon compliant in the next two three years. So that will become a very really huge investment for everybody. But if you don't, if you don't do it, you are out of the business. So it's a very really huge issue for everybody. And also huge like, issue, uh, right? Mm -hmm. In the interest of politics, then again we have a you know the 
thirty percent or more of the, the carbon will become the power sector, as you know, right? And another part of thirty percent is about transportation, right? Then, uh, and the quickest way to to try to get to the zero carbon for Japan is to just you know restart the nuclear plant, you know, and shut and uh, stop, you know, this right. uh, and the thermal plants and uh, and all this. Uh, you know, and the other, and the, or the coal plant, right? Yeah. So then uh, they were like a hundred percent, right? So the, so that that part of the then the suddenly come for this one month or two months, everybody start talking or getting to the agreement that they had to restart those uh, all the nuclear plants all over again. So that that's coming it seems to be coming up, you know. <laughs> I'm done talking. Yeah, that's that's right. And part of the so one of the things that is the outcome of this is that. Um, you will be restricted as a consumer. You will be restricted in ways that are are remarkable um, compared to where we are right now. And the, these restrictions will be for the greater good, that sort of thing, probably giving up certain freedoms or uh, proclivities that we have as a society or as a culture. And the problem there is that you need to be convinced of it in order to swallow these kind of policies. And these um, points of conviction are happening to us right now. What's going on with, you know, asphalt road, roads, you know, melting in, in Canada. They had a huge heat wave there. They've never had that. Um, you know, the the typhoons and the hurricanes that are happening, the, the um, intensity of them, um, the flooding in Germany, in Utah, and in China. Um, these kinds of things happen every once in a while, but they're happening with... Uh, increased frequency and more devastation. I mean, a lot of these, these towns in, for example, Utah or in, in, um, in Germany, they've never been flooded. Uh, not, not at this, um, uh, level and with this intensity growing. So for example, this time next year, uh, going through another rainy season and another winter, um, we'll have more evidence of that. Probably the, the population and the consumers are going to be clamoring because they're going to be afraid they're going to they're going to, you know and it's an ex existential threat that they all feel so you can um bet your bottom dollar that uh you know uh, politicians and and policy will quickly follow in step with meeting that uh, that fear so Yes, that's interesting. Also, uh, we have been talking uh, for the past uh, several months, you know, here and there about sustainability. And of course, we've got the sustainable development goals, which were set by the United Nations. But at the same time, we have seen also um, a shift, you know, um, in, um, well, let's say, corporate governance, which is not a bad thing. But at the same time, uh, it is also very important that uh, there is enough transparency and things are transparent, actually. Something which we haven't been seeing, you know, for the past uh, several months, especially when it comes to, uh, you know, sustainability and, and so on. And it, and it looks like for, like for some corporations, um, uh, sustainability is more uh, is perceived as a marketing stint rather than something which they really want to work on. So I wonder how that will be addressed, you know, and whether this uh, this will be the governments um, all over the world, you know, uh, who will address that, or whether this will be, you know, the um, the push uh, by the consumers actually, you know, and uh, the consumers will they um, what's that request expect more transparency? So it's still mm -hmm. to be seen, of course, but there is a lot of work to be done there. Yeah, a lot of work to be done. And also um, the potential damage that's available. I mean, it's, in, it's right in front of your eyes if it's not done. Um, you know, em embankments, uh, seawall embankments or river river courses or like this this thing that happened in Atami just, um, uh, what, two months ago where they tried to um, – uh, plant some trees uh, along a, a ridge and that collapsed. Um, you know, the amount of damage and the liabilities that are caused by that, that's not necessarily a, um, a climate thing, but that's just the, the result of, of bad planning and bad luck. Um, but these kinds of incidents, the more that they come up, the more damage that's done. Yeah, I, I imagine companies will be 
looking for the marketing opportunity there. But I think um, politicians and, and policymakers will be forced to make uh, difficult uh, decisions. And there'll be people who say, you know, you're taking away my freedom. Or there's people who will say, you know, this is not caused by, um, you know, people or cows farting or, or that sort of thing. Uh, so there'll be that controversy as well. So there's there's still, you know, in, in policy, there's always that, that tug of war. It's always interesting to, to watch it and see who comes out on top. But that's uh, that's part of the thing that we're supposed to be watching here on the show. Right. Yeah, and, and also there's a big corporation like EO and Sony. Now they have to start building a renewable power plant for their own use. So that it will come with a huge investment and maybe huge opportunity. Yes. Right. Yes, but the amazing thing is that, you know, um, well, once again, in order to change everything to sustainable, uh, let's say, production, we need to consume a lot of energy to produce that energy. We need to consume as a society. We need to consume a lot of resources as well. So this is really a very interesting topic. I mean, yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a huge tug of war. It yeah. costs energy. It costs it, it generates carbon to do anything. And so the, the idea is to, let's say they have GMO treated bamboo that they plant uh, throughout, you know, wherever the world. And uh, this is done so that this GMO treated uh, new breed of bamboo absorbs carbon at a magnificent rate. And so you have these bamboo forests, but, you know, even doing that requires, um, you know, expending carbon. So what's, what's the, the end result, how much carbon did you spend versus how much carbon did you absorb from the atmosphere? And in, in reality, how much difference did that actually make? Yes, and we need data, we need information. I mean, the, well, policymakers, of course, but also the population as well. So we need data and information about uh, how things work so that, uh, you know, the decisions can be accepted even though they're not 100, well, it's not a zero sum game, but, you know, people should be convinced that uh, even though there's, there is a trade off, you know, it's worth doing it. But we'll yeah. see. Yeah. Well, no, that, that leads me into, to my next issue. You know, it's, it's actually leadership. We require as, as members of, of society, as voters, as, as contributors to the, the economy, you know, there's, there's little that we can do individually, but collectively, yes, but, Ultimately, we've decided on a on a representative form of government to kind of make policy and to guide society and to make rules and regulations so that we can do things. And this this demand and the the, um, um, the incremental basing up of of our expectations for the quality of leadership just is is so high. And so it's not you know who sings the best song or hit the the most um, home runs as a as a member of of parliament to dictate these these um, movements but we really need um, smart and effective uh, communicators and people who are well versed in in the issues to help us um, define this I'm particularly uh, referencing that with regard to geopolitics and how how many my god how many mistakes that we have to to fix and and address now, even after years of of uh, not uh, adroitly fixing them, they've come home to roost. But let me leave that later. All rise. Hi, Ren. Hey, uh, good morning. Uh, I was thinking of just making a uh, contribution, if I may, uh, from a different room that I heard. Sure. Uh, that in California, uh, because of the um, the utility utility companies and water water companies uh, are really going out of business. Um, so there is a discussion going on about uh, if you have major corporations, you're going to build uh, new buildings, you need to uh, supply the electricity and all those utilities by yourself. You are... Uh, wow. Your, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a uh, it's about leadership. Um, that's one way to do it. Am I still sounding like a, a alien? Am yes, I... you do. But I think that's 
that's unavoidable. It doesn't sound like you're, you know, inside a tunnel though. Okay, good. So I was just, uh, thank, thank you. Uh, thank you again. Yeah, the, uh, the seriousness of this uh, new trend in the state of California is a wake-up call for me. If I want to build a new office or new buildings, I have to think about uh, supplying the utility for my own buildings because the public utility companies are not going to be able to help me anymore. Kind of, it's, it's like a paradigm shift, wouldn't you say? Um, so I just want to share this with you. I don't think it became a law or something. But uh, I think that was a credible uh, trend that I was able to uh, learn from another room on the high tech uh, technology uh, room. Yeah, thank you. I, I sense, and I'm sure many in the room also sense that we are in the, the middle of a paradigm shift. We are still by tentacles attached to how we have lived and done business and considered politics and society. Um, for the last 20 or 30 years. <clears throat> Things have changed in the last 20 or 30 years, but I, I sense that we're at the cusp of, a, of another major change, um, and it's not altogether looking positive or, or great. It's something that we should keep an eye on. It's not just <clears throat> about, you know, ele- um, energy. It's also about health and, and dealing with the pandemic. And, and a virus that is probably going to be with us or variants of it uh, for a long time and something of a of an issue that we just have to deal with and, and live with. But also this this um, great um, division between um, – you see it uh, starkly in the United States, the Democrats and the Republicans. They really don't even talk to each other. They talk different, different – a different language. The um, – uh, encroachment of of uh, big data, GAFA in uh, determining you know freedom of speech and how how people can talk and that sort of thing, and uh, there, there's just so much stuff going on. And in light of that, you've got you know the stuff that's going on with China um, and Taiwan and you know this region of the world that we're standing in uh, right now. So um, I I think um, within the next um, or as as we go go through this this process, it's like you know the the water that's um, slowly boiling when the frogs are sitting in the pot. They don't they don't see it because they're in it, and that's us. It's happening gradually. Some th- sometimes things happen like very quickly, like um, um, a tectonic change happens. Um, but th- that's very rare. But I think you're, you're seeing that now. I think you're seeing <clears throat> these these disasters that are happening with uh, with water and and um, weather are beginning to uh, take effect. And people are, you know, scared and noticing that. And also just the politics of of communication are being um, manipulated. And I think people are beginning to take notice of that as well. Thank you. And I think Aya Sang has uh, come up to the stage. Uh, Maya? Yes. Hello, Aya. Hi. Good morning, everybody. Hi, Timothy Maya. Thank you for having me here. Okay. I'd like to share uh, what the uh, coronavirus uh, vaccination situation in Japan. Um, I think a little over 38% of Japanese people are now fully vaccinated. And I think problem, 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 now is that even though you receive a vaccine coupon and then you call a doctor to you know make an appointment but they simply don't have enough vaccine left so they cannot even get vaccinated even if you want to get vaccinated and you know and yet our government is telling us especially prime minister suga is encouraging us to get vaccinated but there is no vaccination left right now so this is something that our government needs to work out and you know um if they want us to get vaccinated they need to have ready uh, and you know uh, and um people have uh vaccine coupon already and yet they cannot even make an appointment to get vaccinated so this is something that uh they have to figure it out 
And the other problem is that even though, even if you have uh, like symptoms like coughing and fever, you can even get a PCR test for free. And my friend had uh, symptoms and he couldn't smell, he couldn't taste, taste and he had a fever. So um, he called the uh, healthcare center and the lady there told him that it's not a COVID. So you don't have to, you know, get a PCR. So he was staying at home, but his symptom got worse. So he called his doctor and he went there and he took PCR and he was positive. And then, you know, he wanted to be hospitalized because he has a family with him. But, you know, uh, because, uh, because of the healthcare center told him to stay at home. So he got worse. And then, you know, he has to a call paramedic because he'd, he he couldn't even breathe. So he was finally uh, hospitalized for two weeks. But now over 2,000 people in Tokyo are staying at home because they don't even have uh, enough beds left, especially ventilators. So this is, I, I think this is a huge problem right now, especially in Tokyo, but not just in Tokyo, but all over Japan. So I'm done speaking. Thank you. Thank you, Aya. Yes, um, we've talked about this um, uh, every time we open this room. Um, this is a, a point of, of contention. One of the um, theories was that uh, they were reporting a, um, a shortage of COVID vaccines um, that are available in order to um, convince more people to, to get it. So I find it very difficult to believe that um, Japan is lacking in supply because they were the first to uh, generate um, uh, the COVID vaccine in, in large stock and so much so that they were donating millions of doses uh, to, uh, to friendly countries uh, in the region. Um, so part of it is, you know, a marketing ploy, but also um, I've heard the same stories that, that people are, are getting uh, shortchanged by um, not having the vaccine available when they need it or calling the, uh, the health centers. So it's, it's so counterintuitive. Japan does so many things so well um, that something like this should be um, not too difficult. But the Suga administration is getting uh, very low points for uh, crisis management and, uh, you know, their ability to handle the surge of the, the Delta variant. Um, and, that will all come out, um, you know, in the wash in, in the uh, upcoming election. And also, you'll have a lot of people that are reporting on it. The, I think the reports now are a little bit muted. I think people are not um, favorable to writing uh, such negative things uh, currently. But I think um, when it becomes so remarkable, I mean, for example, just in, in your small circle, you, you know, it's impacted you personally. Um, I think there are a lot of people like that, and I think the press will start picking that up at a time that is most unfavorable to the uh, current prime minister. Mm -hmm. And the point exactly. is also, yes, that, uh, well, there are a lot of, or not a lot, but there are several very good websites, you know, which uh, provide information and it is uh, updated day by day. The problem is that uh, they haven't been, uh, you know, uh, promoted is not a good word in this sense, but still, you know, the, the majority of uh, the population doesn't know about them. So that's a big problem, you know, because uh, at the end of the day, uh, if you know, don't know about, you know, uh, that the information is available, there is no way for you to find it. If you don't really dedicate uh, time and, you know, effort on searching uh, for it. So, yes, I agree with you. It's really difficult at the moment. And um, people are so, frustrated and wonder what, what to believe. But anyway, Timothy, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, let me address one of those issues. Mm. The, um, one of the things the Japanese are extremely good at is counting and, and analyzing numbers and, you know, talking about the, the, the current situation. They have great access to information and they can, um, they can manage information extremely well. So, I recommend people, um, uh, you know, go to the web page of the um, the, the Kante, the uh, the foreign minister, the prime minister's office, and um, that address is um, www.kante.go.jp. 
Kante is the Prime Minister's office in Japanese, Kante, K-A-N-T-E-I, dot G-O, dot J-P. And that's where you'll find the latest information, like um, Maya was saying, it's de- updated, um, you know, throughout the day. Uh, current information, not only on Japan's stance internally, but also uh, the global situation there. And there's also other um, related information there. And um, that's the first point I'd like to make. And the second point I'd like to make is that um, this technology that we're using now, Clubhouse, is such a game changer because uh, in a situation like yours, Aya, there are rooms, there are people, there are, there are collections of, of people who are engaged and in, involved in whatever uh, domain you, you want to talk about who actually have hands-on experience. And, and Clubhouse allows you to reach out to those people. And that's part of what this room is about. But, you know, our, our scope is just limited to Japanese politics and what's going on there. But there are different rooms there. And I'm just I'm so grateful uh, for Clubhouse. I spend way too much time on it. Um, but the, the amount of information that's available there and the, um, the quality is uh, far beyond what you're going to pick up or read. And the other thing is that people have so much doubt about the information they get from the um, formerly go-to parties, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, these, these big press houses that had so much credibility and we had so much confidence in. Those are basically in the trash now. People don't trust them. Um, and so we're, we're in this paradigm shift that we were talking about earlier, where you get your information and how do you make these decisions and who do you rely upon? It's, um, it's a huge issue that I think we haven't quite, um, come to terms with yet, but the, um, the fact that not the fact, the story that the, uh, supply is low. So if you're going to get the vaccine, if you're sitting on the, the fence, you better go ahead and get it. Telling people that the supply is low enhances the value of what's there. And um, as with this kind of curve of, of who's becoming inoculated and who's not, there are vaxxers and anti-vaxxers. And the number of vaxxers compared to anti-vaxxers, the anti-vaxxers are beginning to take a little bit more hold. I, I don't want to get uh, vaccinated. I don't believe it. I don't believe in mass. I don't believe what the government is telling me. That population needs to be addressed by the the powers that be. So one of the tactics is to enhance the value. And by doing that is reducing the uh, perception of availability. So um, uh, Mr. Suga desperately wants to have as many people vaccinated as possible so that he can wave that flag. And so there are a lot of tactics and a lot of uh, techniques that are being applied to do that. Okay. So, okay, let's, let's move on. I don't know if, if um, Dr. Nagy is still feeding his kids peanut butter and and um, pancakes, a great combination, by the way, I highly endorse. But anyway, I'd like to get into uh, geopolitics a little bit. Uh, Stephen is actually the, the real expert there, but there are things going on that impact uh, Japanese politics and how we live and do business here in Japan that are not dictated by, you know, Japanese politics. It's actually more of a, of a, um, a wider spectrum there. It's not my area of expertise, but it is something that I think needs to be addressed in this room. So I just tee it up. And for people who are more familiar and more adept at it, I'd like to hear your comments, too. But, you know, this this whole situation, you know, the the biggest impact for uh, Japan in this region is, number one, the United States, the relationship of Japan with the with the United States in terms of of trade, investment and defense, um, the countries are, are tied uh, very, very tightly together. And that relationship is the most important for the Japanese. Second most important is China. Uh, and the Japanese have a relationship, an ongoing relationship with China, but it's kind of a love-hate, mostly on the hate side. But uh, China is such a dominant force if it wants to be, if it really um, desires to be more of a dominant force in this region, it can be. It's big enough to be that. It's the second largest economy in the world. It can kind of do what it wants to do. Um, and uh, the other countries in the region are going to have to uh, come to terms with that. As a consequence of that, there are lots of naval vessels that are, are um, coming and doing joint exercises uh, to, in this region. There is a South Korea-Japan 
U.S. exercise that's going on in South Korea that's making the North Koreans very angry and making them not answer the phone anymore, the crisis phone that they had set up. Um, it's creating a lot of, uh, of um, a diplomatic uh, deadlock there. And uh, with China, there's a, um, you know, there's a lot going on with um, Hong Kong. We talk about that from time to time. The, the problem with talking about Hong Kong is that people who live in Hong Kong or who have um, uh, some good connection there are reluctant to actually talk out loud about it. It's the same thing in talking about China, that if you talk about China in a negative way, there are repercussions for that. And they practice that um, very, very um, explicitly um, so that the message is not missed. And the problem that we have here is that um, this whole situation with COVID and the source of COVID, um, as we've heard for the last two years, is that um, it was a natural occurrence. It didn't start in Wuhan. It started in Wuhan, but that was because people were eating bat wings and, and drinking soup and, and things like that. And the, the mantra there was that it is pretty much impossible to conceive of it happening, happening in a laboratory. And the, um, uh, the international community had a, an investigation that was allowed to go in eventually um, under the auspices of the, uh, the Chinese government. They did an investigation, they visited the lab and they came out with a report that was inconclusive. And the United States and Dr. Fauci were, were very you know, adamant about, you know, and not only them, but also uh, Facebook and, and YouTube, if you say something about it starting in the lab and that it was it was created for a purpose, you actually were blackballed. They just had a second team that went in um, and left um, Wuhan, um, I think, on Monday or Tuesday. And in order for the team to go there and gain access and be able to do their work, they all had to sign a contract that said, that um, in order to have access and to go to conduct this this um, this investigation, your result must be that it did not start in the Wuhan um, viral uh, facility, that it was more likely to have been created by a genetic mutation that happened in nature. They all signed that because they wanted to do the investigation. As soon as that investigation was finished and those people left China, all of a sudden they started to go public. And I don't know if you're reading much of this in the news, but they um, released the, the fact that the Chinese uh, forced them as a precondition to going to do their investigation, that they would not find anything done um, on the Chinese part. It wasn't the fault of the CCP and uh, the Chinese had nothing to do with it. <clears throat> And so that is a, um, a pretty uh, bad thing to happen that uh, they would uh, predetermine is as a condition for going in. And then the second thing that uh, they said was, even in light of that, and as a consequence of our investigation, even though the, the Chinese government had more than uh, a year and a half to clean up and to cover up and to do whatever they wanted to do, even in light of that, our conclusions are that it is more likely to have happened in this lab than not. So I don't know why this hasn't reached uh, more of a, um, a crescendo in uh, public press, but it is inescapable that it will be coming um, more uh, public and people will be coming uh, more angered about it. The reason why I'm talking about this now is because this could change the dynamic of how China is viewed um, by all of the other parties, you know, when Trump was, you know, um, after he was president, he said, you know, we should build the Chinese. We should punish them. We should make them pay for it. Um, that is not really being talked about too much in the Biden administration. But should these reports come out and be, be verified, you know, all of a sudden the anger against the Chinese for uh, producing and disseminating this this uh, this virus is going to have a uh, huge consequences. And the most huge consequence is not just um, military or political right now, but it's only six months away. And that is the um, launch of the Winter Olympics in China. 
That's only six months away. Did you realize that? We haven't even gone into the Paralympics. And six months away, we have the Winter Olympics in China. So um, the fact that um, they are going, they're going to take this, this strategy of having bubbles of, of where the athletes are interacting with the, re- uh, the coaches and the referees and that sort of thing. They're, they're um, retrograding their, um, uh, their uh, Olympic sites to accommodate that. So everything that the Japanese did that looked pretty good, that had a, a, a good impact, even though it took a lot of the fun out, um, will be replicated in the Beijing Olympics. And also um, the spectators, they're going to be doing something so that the spectators, they've got to you know, somehow pay for it. But this is a big deal for China. They want to do really well. And if it, if it doesn't happen that way, you know, and that cookie begins to crumble, um, you can see a lot of other um, repercussions in this region. And so I flagged that um, for everybody's attention. I don't know if Dr. Nagy's here. He's not. Um, we've also got um, this this thing that's going on in Afghanistan uh, where the United States has pulled out and now they're, they've had to send in um, more uh, Marine guards, um, 3,000, maybe 6,000. Um, it's not a rescue, but they're taking uh, the people out of the U.S. Embassy in Kabul. And uh, that is happening over the next uh, couple of days. Um, and one has to wonder why um, the, the uh, rapid pullout and how come the forces are being redeployed. And uh, although that whole region is just fraught with, with difficulty and a lot of people who um, hate the United States, the focus is, is um, being diminished there, but being focused here. So for those of us who live in this region, this, this um, tug of war, um, with China, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and um, the rest of the world with regard to um, um, geopolitical uh, positioning so that who's going to be the, the person on top controlling, you know, shipping and uh, diplomacy among the, the various countries is going to become a huge issue. Um, and so within the next six months, you're going to be seeing a lot of active um, engagement there. Um, there's a lot of exercises going on now. The, the British Navy, the German Navy, the uh, Nor- uh, Norway's Navy, um, the United States, France. There, there's just a, almost a, an um, armada of, of things going on in this region, uh, not to say anything about um, the, the, the games that are being played in the Gulf of Oman among uh, the Japanese forces as well. So. It's something that I flag to your attention because it will be a topic of, of great uh, consternation for us and something that we will be talking about a lot more. Hello, Stephen. He's swallowing his mouthful of peanut butter laden pancakes. Timothy, I think that you haven't had your breakfast yet. So. I haven't. I haven't. I've been right. up preparing for this room. There we go. Like, yeah. You can hear me now? Oh. You're on vacation, my God. You're near flowing water. I'm actually outside in the rain. I fed my kids, as you said. Um, but thanks very much for um, promoting the room. And um, yes, we're going to talk about the geopolitics of the Indo-Pacific with a large focus on Japan and how it's working with other countries. And you would be surprised it's even working with China in, in third countries in terms of infrastructure. So we're going to look at the region, why it's evolving. Uh, why we're shifting away from the Asia-Pacific view of the world to an Indo-Pacific view of the world. We're going to look at um, India in the Indo-Pacific, um, Europe in the Indo-Pacific, Japan in the Indo-Pacific. And this is all going to come back to thinking about why Japan is part of this story. And um, I'm hoping that you could all bring your expertise. And I'm going to bring some friends with some expertise so we can have this, not me talking, but um, many experts talking about um, this important topic and how it affects you. So I really look forward to all of you, and I really thank Timothy and Maya for um, putting forward this proposal, and uh, I hope, hopefully, it will be synergistic with um, the Japan Politics 101 that Timothy and Maya um, host. So I look forward to seeing all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before we close up the room, um, Maya, um, I'm reminded of the, um, the fires in Greece. Um, there was uh, wild um, forest fires that 
that started on a, a couple of islands because of the the wind that was blowing in. And sometimes um, these things start, um, the, the combustion starts instantaneously um, just because of lightning strikes and sometimes just um, because of, of uh, uh, just combustion. Um, but um, I talked with my friend who is um, very um, engaged with, uh, with Greece and he told me um, yesterday that these fires are just a catastrophe for the country of Greece. And we were talking earlier about the um, climate and um, for, for these forests, these um, um, uh, long-term forests to have gone up in smoke and just the, the amount of damage and uh, the social uh, disruption that this causes um, just boggles the mind. So he is, he's very concerned about that. And one of the reasons why I bring that up is because <clears throat> immediately um, other countries uh, came to the rescue to um, contribute firefighters and rescue vehicles. And the United States, it took them a couple of days to get it together. But people from Israel and all around the region uh, weighed in to support. Uh, he lamented the fact that they didn't receive anything uh, from Japan. Um, but maybe, you know, fighting forest fires is, is not their, their forte. And maybe um, Greece and Japan, the relationships there are not founded as, as strongly as with other countries. I don't know, but this kind of uh, reciprocity that occurs uh, with countries is, is a, it's a signature event, and particularly among the Japanese with regard to overseas investment and, and contributions and, and infrastructures um, and that sort of thing. And, and the Japanese are always um, at, at the forefront of that. So the fact that they weren't this time is somewhat remarkable. And the only, only other thing I'm going to end up with now is that I, I turned on the news this morning. There was a 7.4 um, uh, earthquake in Haiti, um, which always suffers one way or the other. Um, and so I, I think that there's a, a lot of um, um, international cooperation that's going to be uh, devoted there. I don't know what Japan's uh, role in that is going to be. But anyway, uh, with that, I'd like to close up my comments and open the room up for a further discussion among many of our uh just incredible uh, audience members and um, then wrap it up and maybe talk about our vote. When are we going to have our, what time of the, the day are we going to have our, our next clubhouse room, Maya? Yes, indeed. Ren, first. Okay. Uh, hey, I was just watching uh, a, a CBS uh, evening news this morning uh, in Taiwan, actually. And they were talking about the uh, very deteriorating uh, situation in Afghanistan. And uh, I'm asking uh, Timothy uh, your opinion on uh, how to explain this. You know, the reason we, uh, the United States uh, citizen, we, are, we all understand we are withdrawing the troops from Afghanistan so we can focus on uh, the geopolitical issues in uh, China, Japan, and you know Pacific region, but now we are now pull, seems like we are being pulled back into Afghanistan again. Uh, so the strategy of focusing on the Asia Pacific uh, strategic uh, peace uh, is going to be uh, affected uh, one way or another. Uh, that's the the common view, but I would like to hear. Uh, experts' view from uh, from you, Timothy and Stefan, if if that's appropriate for this room. Yeah, I don't think the the public um, story is that they're withdrawing from Afghanistan in order to supplement what's going on in the Asia Pacific. I don't think that's part of the story. I think the the story is they've been doing it for twenty years. Uh, they figured that they've done what they can do, and it's time to pull out. Uh, they've just run into some problems with the timing and the, the way it's done and also the, um, the, what the Taliban has done in reaction to that. But I think this is more in, in Stephen's valley. Yeah. You know, it's a, it's a tough question um, uh, to think about what, what is, why is the United States doing it at this time? I do think, frankly, uh, 20 years of fatigue and I think frustration in terms of the United States can't change substantially what's happening on the ground in terms of the inter-ethnic fighting and the inter-religious fighting and the social economic problems within Afghanistan. So this is not something that is just limited to the 20 years of the United States and allied um, 
being in Afghanistan, but, you know, it's really long-term challenges with Afghanistan being, you know, it's a country with a lot of different valleys. It creates challenges in terms of integrating the country so it works as a whole and it works more functionally. And, you know, frankly, they just don't have the strong human capital to put the country in different divisions. And it's being pulled in one direction by Pakistan, another direction by Iran. Um, and then we have the Wahhabi um, um, influences from Saudi Arabia that are really, you know, pushing extremism still in, in the country. So there's a lot of forces pulling it in a couple of different, many different directions. And that makes it really a challenge. But I think the Biden administration, and this would have been the Trump administration, and whatever is the next administration, the clear focus is consolidating resources for the Indo-Pacific, for what is seen as extreme competition with China over the coming decades. And I say decades because that's how it's viewed in Washington. And I think that's how it's viewed in many capitals. It's that the United States wants to marshal its resources, increase its competitivity, uh, build big better in home so that it can compete with, with China in the digital realm, in terms of tech, in terms of um, the issues in the South and East China Sea, and presenting uh, a governance model that works. And pouring resources into Afghanistan, frankly, um, and, and I, I, I don't like to say this, it's, it's not in the interest of the United States because it doesn't have any payback. Um, as long as the Taliban don't promote terrorism and don't harbor terrorists, um, the United States and other countries are likely to leave it alone. Um, the moment that they promote terrorism, the moment they harbor terrorists, is where we're going to see uh, the United States go back and probably um, intimately bomb using drones and other technologies, um, the supporters of, of these terrorist groups. And it really just goes to show you that human rights and these kind of normative issues really are outcome by national interests. And I think it's national interest driving this decision rather than um, just fatigue. Thanks, thanks, Stephen. Thanks, Timothy. For, but Timothy, it sounds like whatever happens in in Afghanistan, uh, it wouldn't it wouldn't uh, change how uh, the Biden administration approached the uh, Asia Pacific region's uh, strategy. Uh, no, that sounds no. like what you're saying. I, I think. Yeah, I, I I think those are two separate issues. But I also think that um, so what's happening in Afghanistan now today is going to continue for the next two or three weeks. And you will see if there's going to be um, a push because, you know, Biden has said, you know, you're not going to see, you know, helicopters rescuing people from rooftops. That's not what this is about. This is not a rescue mission. We're just trying to remove the people who are in the Afghan, um, in the Kabul embassy um, and relocate them. Um, if, if the Taliban uh, were to do something that was untoward in order to score a uh, a public relations coup, now is the time for them to do that. If they can have it so that um, indeed the helicopters are rescuing diplomats from rooftops, that would, um, that would be a big black eye. So please continue to watch that because this is happening in real time right now. You're not getting a whole lot of news out of it, but um, if you're um, clever about you know where you uh, direct your your uh, viewing time, uh, you will be able to find out uh, more and more about it. And plus, you know, every week uh, join this room and um, get an update on on how that's um, running out. But it doesn't look very very good. It's it's not a good look for the United States to be pulling out after supporting women and teachers and and the culture there and um, now leaving. And a lot of those people are going to be. Um, victimized as a, as a result of the change of government. But. Yes, Maya, I had a quick question for Timothy. I um, know you mentioned that um, the Japanese people have now tended to kind of push aside uh, news sources such as the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. Could you tell me what news sources are the Japanese people relying on for the most accurate information at this point? Uh, I don't think the Japanese people were looking at the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times as their source. Um, the sources here in, in, in Japan remain to be, um, you know, Nikkei. Nikkei is the most trusted of, of uh, the publications. And also the, um, you know, the Japanese, um, yeah, the Japanese rely a lot on the uh, shukanshi, the, um, the weekly 
uh, magazines that come out that um, produce some trash, um, some kind of uh, suggestive photographs, but they are very popular and they are really hot on the news. Uh, the news here in Japan is um, uh, managed and controlled. The press club has um, limited access to uh, the policymakers and their questions are vetted. So it's not a, a full, um, you know, uh, third uh, or fourth um, uh, leg of, of the government, the, the press here. But <clears throat> I think in the United States, it is even becoming more questionable about uh, the the news and how it's produced and uh, the veracity of it. So my comment was most mostly directed at what's going on in the United States rather than here in Japan. In Japan, I think it's just a, a slow boil and the, the population is relatively um, satisfied with NHK and the Nikkei and the Bunshun and s some of the other uh, minor uh, publications. People generally, um, just be, being human nature, they they select a newspaper that they somewhat like, um, and then they stick to it. And even though the policies or the publications or the, the stances of the newspaper change, as you've seen with the Japan Times, it's changed dramatically over the last four years, um, people still stick to it. So I hope that responds to your question. And can I add that? something here? Thank you. Jennifer, can I add something here? Yes, please. Yeah, I live in Tokyo. And what I uh, realized that most Japanese people don't speak English. And, you know, and if you speak English, yes, I read New York Times, Washington Post and stuff like that. But most people don't even read those magazines. They begin don't care. With. Yeah, they don't care. So what we, um, you know, if you want to, you know, uh, know about something, you have to go grab it. But they are written in English, most of them. So if you don't speak English, your information is really limited, I think, because our, you know, government uh, the media is, um, they all filtered the information. So sometimes the information we get is not the information we, we are looking for. So um, if you want to know something, you have to go out and grab it. But you have to understand English. And if you understand English, you can watch like, um, you know, CNN, NBC, um, maybe Fox, I don't know. But, you know, it depends. Um, I think if you speak English, if you understand English, you can have more sources and you have more um, access to those information. That's my opinion. Can I add something for everyone in case people don't know this? Yes, if please. you, uh, thank you. If you uh, uh, subscribe to Mainichi Shimbun uh, digital version, you can also have free access to Wall Street Journal, the Japanese version of Wall Street Journal. So even if you are not uh, comfortable reading uh, English Wall Street Journal, I think Wall Street Journal's Japanese translation is, is doing pretty well. And so... Um, I'm doing this for my friend who works for my Nichi Shimbun, I guess, <laughs> kind of advertisement. <laughs> but I think it is, uh, I think people uh, can, uh, even if the, 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 the news is written in Japanese, if the source is coming from Wall Street Journal, it, it offers you another view point, right? It's like a stereo, you have two eyes, it's a stereo vision. So I, I thought I wanted to share this with everyone. Yeah, just like Timothy said, you know, most, peop most Japanese people don't even care what, you know, um, New York Times are, uh, Washington Post and, you know, some other uh, journals. And like Timothy said, we read newspapers. Like um, so many people rely on those information from the Shukanshi, uh, I think, um, and TV. So um, if, but if that's written in Japanese and if you're still interested, yes, I think, um, people would read those magazines um, written in Japanese, I, I mean, translated into Japanese. But unless you are interested in, you know, reading those magazines, um, you are, I think you are out of information. Yeah, I think what you're going to find more and more here in Japan is people will curate their sources of information and include, you know, um, a dabbling of, of clubhouse rooms where they're information that they've received is verified or questioned, and it's just going to be curated. Uh, Japan typically lags maybe four or five years 
behind trends in the United States of, of this magnitude. So I think the Japanese people are relatively satisfied with the, the news that they receive, including the 15 minutes of, you know, what's popular to eat and how you do the cooking. These are on, you know, national primetime uh, news programs, you know, talking about food or uh, maybe even um, a, little, a little bit more importantly, sports and what's going on. But, um, you know, filling that, that primetime news channel with not news, but, you know, food or what's going on with the, the latest singer uh, in uh, K-pop, that sort of thing. Anyway, we've spent too much time on that. Uh, don't want to keep Ted waiting. Ted, you've got something to say and welcome to the floor. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, I'll just, I'll be brief. Um, you were kind enough to bring up the topic of Afghanistan, very timely. Um, one of the reasons, well, the primary reason Biden is doing this is the same reason that Trump negotiated and struck that deal with the Taliban to remove U.S. forces, and that is American voters want out of Afghanistan uh, and out of the Middle East in general. Um, whether or not that's a good idea is a, another subject, but that's um, this current sentiment of the voters. But more relevant to what you cover, uh, Timothy and Stephen, is you have a growing uh, debate within the defense establishment in Washington and increasingly in Congress who uh, understand that while President Biden is doing what any president would do, being uh, attentive to the wishes of the voters, uh, they're concerned about what signal this sends to our partners and our adversaries in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, you may have noticed defense, Japanese Defense Minister Kishi's uh, recent remarks to the Australian newspaper in which he cast doubt about America's uh, uh, military uh, Re reliability you know, reliability, and even decline in some regards. And uh, you have similar concerns in places like, you know, India, a member of the Quad who says, you know, well, if you guys are leaving Afghanistan, where does this leave us? Afghanistan is in our neighborhood and we also border China. Uh, this has implications for us. So you have folks in the defense establishment in Washington, as well as within Congress saying, how do we manage this so that we reassure our partners, um, we're not just gonna cut and run when the going gets tough. Uh, because really they look at us and they say, well, the US has only really lost 2,300 lives in Afghanistan. That in terms of a war is considered quite small numbers in terms of loss of life. Yes, there've been 20,000 injured, but again, in terms of warfare, that's not very serious. What happens when things really get rough over with China? Can Uncle Sam be relied upon? I'm not here to say one way or another uh, what's going to happen, but this is increasingly a debate um, going on within the Pentagon, going on within Congress, and Absolutely. trying to reassure our partners. And I know it's going to affect what you, Timothy, and what you, Stephen, uh, you know, analyze and, and discuss each week. So that's all I wanted to share. No, it's it's a valid concern, and it is um, something that the the Japanese in in the defense um, industry frequently question is, you know, will, will the Americans actually be there for us? You know, what did they do in 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 these other areas? You know, the, the they've they haven't really fulfilled their their obligations as um, outsiders see it. So. It is a valid question that people weigh and uh, they make, um, you know, political decisions or, uh, you know, defense positions accordingly. Yeah. Yes. Can I add at the last minute? Okay. Sure. Yes, please do. Yes. Yeah, so, so one, uh, w one point that maybe uh, have a significant meaning here to Japanese politics is uh, the, uh, the day that, you know, the Anthony Bankin was uh, nominated. Uh, it would be the you know Secretary of the State. You know the 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 first call that he was about he had was about the call about how to deal with the Iran and how to deal with the China. So since then, it still seems to be that the U.S. policy under the the Biden and Anthony Blinken 
has been just to uh, solely focus on uh, putting uh, Iran under the control, which they did by signing, uh, you know, lift in, in uh, embargo and sanctions. And also, you know, the, another like a collusion of China. So for that, what is our previous discu discussion that we had before the, on how to label China going forward, like TPP or this thing has been really disappeared. So it looks like the four, you know, U.S. and the only plan at this time is just to like a line up and put the pressure to see, you know, if we can win while we just go into the, the battle. It does seems to be a plan. So that's my one kind of uh, update. And then uh, and uh, the small thing, and I say that Greece and all this, you know, uh, the, the Greek, when the Greek leased the port to China, and then I guess everybody thought that that, that is about to be like a sub-colony of uh, China, right? So, well, that's uh, at least on their way. Yeah, so for that, you know, the, the, because of the financial problem, the European EU didn't really want to, you know, Greece anymore, and uh, so the rest of the world, right? And also the, regarding the Afghanistan, right? And uh, I think I mentioned this to you the last week, which was uh, now that Iran is, you know, U.S. going to lift the sanctions, so now Iran is going to come back to the U.S. camp again. Then uh, Afghanistan was uh, kind of important because it was, uh, uh, it, 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 it's just between uh, Iran and uh, China, but now that like, uh, the Iran's here, so they, we don't need Afghanistan anymore, right, in a, in a particular purpose. And also the U U.S. is uh, leaving, you know, the Iraq, right, at the request of a uh, Iraq like a leader, right? See, so for that, like uh, the U.S. is uh, pretty much like uh, putting uh, Iran into our kind of a partnership, and now that like, we are back to battle against the China, then uh, that, and but I, don't, I don't know how that's going to turn out, but that seems to be the only plan that we have moving at this point. Uh, and um, let's see, and uh, regarding this Afghanistan and the U.S., the U.S. has tried to move their you know, Afghanistan troops to the Pakistan or, in, or India, but they have refused. So that's what we're printing out, right? Yeah, so for that, that India has no position to complain about it yeah, because it's going to offer to move the U.S. troops there, right? So um, I think, you know, so U.S., Japan is going to increase the, you know, defense budget significantly, right? So it's about $60 billion now, you know, at least uh, we may try to double or triple very quickly, right? So uh, as of February of this year, you know, the defense minister already made that uh, announcement that they're going, they are not going, they're going to remove the one percent the GBD cap and start, you know, adding all this, uh, you know, defense budget. So now that the U.S. is going to go into the, uh, like, a, a back to being more like a, a military uh, country again, right? Like uh, Japan used to in uh, before World War Two. Uh, then uh, I guess like, the idea there was uh, that from Japan side, from U.S. side, you know, Japan should, you know, try to defend its own country when it's attacked. It cannot sit on uh, doing nothing when the U.S. has to fight, you know, and uh, lose uh, U.S. lives, you know. And so for that, you know, the, the Japan should be, you know, at least leading to defend its own country, which they are not prepared to do at this moment. So that's uh, the view from the U.S. And Japan, you know, they have, they have a conversation that, well, you know, the U.S. may pull out like Afghanistan, Iraq, so they have to start doing something, you know, after all the 50 years. And that's all. Thank you for that. Um, no, I was just going to make a, a brief comment about uh, the, the Japanese Air Force <clears throat> is really scoring high marks in terms of capability and competence. With this, we're going to finish today's room. Thank you very much for sticking with us. And we're looking forward to seeing you next week again, Sunday, 8.30. Thank you. Have a great day.